can uh, indicate the presence chair. So shall I, shall I proceed? Please. Mr. McPherson. McPherson. Honorable I'm McPherson. Here. I'm here. Okay. Thank you. M Mrs. Hermans. Uh, Present. Hermans. Mr. You. Mulder. Honorable Mulder. I'm, I'm present, Chair. Mr. Mbuyani. Chair President. Thank you. Mr. Okay. Cuthbert. Honorable Cuthbert. Okay, wonderful. Ms. Ms. Mutahu. Ms. Mutahu. Okay. Ms. Yaku. Yaku. Yaku, Honorable Yaku. Present. Thank you. Ms. Mantashe. Present. Honorable Mantashe. Present. Thank you. Okay. Chair, um, that, that's what I don't know if Mr. Thring is on, on, on the platform yet, Chair. Yes. So, in terms of uh, the members of the committee, Chair? Chair? Yes. Yes. What? 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 Say? what say? Okay. Thank you very much. Honorable Mwatse, thank you very much and welcome. Um, let's morning. actually then confirm because I think uh, it's the uh, portfolio committee members which actually allows us to actually do, to be able to proceed. Can I actually then ask that we uh, get the agenda um, screen? The agenda will be shared on the screen now, Chair. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, in the opening and welcome, it's the point we've got now, apologies, adoption of the agenda, it's, Agenda item is the update, uh, COVID-19 measures, um, issue of questions for clarity and comments, and closing remarks. Can we actually then uh, ask that uh, we um, look at, in terms of secretary to the opening and welcome. So I should actually be able to say I did uh, get uh, communication earlier. And uh, in the communication is that the minister is not feeling well. Uh, I don't know how bad it is because uh, I think um, we know our minister is a hard worker. Right? And uh, basically, I think he knew this morning when he woke up and, and actually was starting to actually connect that uh, it will be not that easy for him to come through. Let's actually acknowledge that. But uh, obviously, we do actually have uh, the ministry represented in terms of presence in the meeting. We do actually also have the, the DG. So the presentation will actually be uh, proceeding and as actually requested by the committee. But I think it was quite important that one actually indicate that um, when we actually have a challenge like this, uh, for those who actually were coming as people who will be giving support, when they have actually responsibility to be able to actually work on a program which was not planned, it's not easy. So deputy ministers uh, will be able to assist us uh, and the DG will be also part of the presentation. I'm, I wanted just to say, um, we actually know the minister is not actually well for the deputy ministers and the DG. We know that uh, it's a very quick uh, instruction or request for you to actually follow through. We will actually make sure that we actually acknowledge that. But for our meeting, we will actually proceed as agreed to. Sure. Hoping the minister recovers quite uh, uh, quickly. So can I actually then, uh, um, uh, with the, uh, the apologies, uh, uh, Secretariat, pick up on that before we adopt the agenda? Chair, there is an apology from Mr. Sibukulu, but Mr. McPherson would like to raise, would well, like to ask a question, Chair. There's, there's a, we are on apologies because I've just opened the meeting. Uh, Honourable McPherson. Thank you. Um, I have uh, heard you say that the minister is not well and uh, these things happen. But the truth of the matter is, is that we are now, uh, you know, nearly two months into this crisis 
and the minister has been before this committee once um, and has, you know, attempted to answer questions. Um, and, and I think that it is absolutely critical that we get an understanding of when the minister will be coming to the committee um, because meetings are shifted around to suit him um, and, you know, he's, you know, seemingly unwell today, which I uh, cannot confirm or deny. Um, but I, I really think that it is becoming an untenable situation where we have only had the, an engagement with the minister once, uh, and that was, you know, barely an engagement. So I would really like to know when the minister will be coming to the committee, to the to the portfolio committee, not a joint committee, and that we will actually have a real uh, and uh, deliberate opportunity to uh, to engage the minister. Okay, can, can I just uh, do the thanks very much, uh, Honorable McPherson, of the comment. But can I just say, can we just confirm that the minister is not well? He is unable to attend our meeting. Because I don't think it's a point where we actually trying to confirm if ever he's well or not. The thing which we know this morning, I got the, the call early, the minister is not well. But I think we're going ahead. When the minister will be able to come before the committee again, uh, McPherson, I think uh, it's something that we can follow through through the meeting. But let me just take your note. We will actually take the comment that uh, he, he is not well, and uh, we, will, we do have the presentations uh, circulated late last night, and uh, we will actually be going through that. We will actually get uh, to speak to the minister to find more time to be able to engage with the portfolio committee. So I think that's the agreement, Secretariat. Chair, Mrs. Hermans wants to address the committee, wants to raise a question, ask a question, Chair. Mrs. Hermans. Okay. All right. Uh, let me ask uh, Hermans. Good morning, Chair. Um, I just wanted to speak on the issue of the minister's apology. We know that we have a very hardworking minister. We know that as a committee, we have to do oversight over the work that is done, uh, especially at this time of uh, COVID-19. But we also know that the pace has been very high. And um, I think we must uh, take this opportunity to wish the minister a speedy recovery. But I think, uh, Chairperson, if there has been a um, agreement that one of the deputy ministers will do the presentation, then I think we must stand as briefed uh, by the committee and then allow the minister to answer questions at a later stage. Thank you. So can, can I actually then uh, ask that we look at the agenda? Uh, honorable members, uh, there's an agenda before us. Uh, if you can actually get uh, members to actually indicate. I know the, the comments from Hermans and McPherson. Can I ask the committee to speak to the adoption of the agenda? Chair. Okay. Ms. Mwakse, Chair. Honorable Mwakse. Morning, members. Yes, Chair, I move for adoption of the agenda with the apologies. Thank you very much. Can we get the uh, second for the adoption? I rise to support the adoption of the agenda, Chairperson. Ms. Mantashe. Ms. Honorable Mantashe. Okay. So, is there any objection? Okay. If there's none, then can, can I then. Um, request that we actually go to the item that follows. The, let me just say, uh, Deputy Ministers and the DG, I know um, that none of you actually had an idea of uh, the challenge the minister is facing, and uh, you're actually stepping in in the space. You might have actually looked at how best you can be able to work on around the presentation. So I would actually ask then uh, Deputy Minister uh, Majola and Gina to be able to actually give us sense. The DG is there as well, because I know that in that uh, leadership collective of the ministry and department, 
we can actually be able to and then get the suggestion on how you're going to proceed uh, in terms of the presentation before us. Um, can I then invite uh, the ministry? Um, I'm sure then we will actually then get guidance from you in terms of how we proceed. Good morning, everybody. Good morning to the ministry. Welcome, DG. Floor is yours, ministry. I see Honorable Three connecting. I've been welcome. on for a while, Chair. Thank you. <laughs> welcome, welcome, Mr. Three. Just checking Honorable my video. Three. Thank you. Yes. Um, ministry? So please, please uh, don't uh, unmute uh, uh, Secretariat. Chair, they are oh. unmute, Chair. Oh, they are mute here. Okay. Floor is the ministry. I see the presentation coming up. Chair, uh, if I... Okay. Honorable DG, okay. oh, DG? The DG chair. Uh, thanks. Thanks, chair. Um, uh, chair, um, uh, DM Gina was going to do a, um, uh, um, a, a sort of overview and uh, introductory um, uh, statement. And then yeah. I would uh, do through do the presentation. But I don't know if DM Gina is linked up already. Oh, OK. OK. Can, can we just check then? Um, thank you, DG. Um, DM Gina, if ever she's uh, connected. Uh, chair, it doesn't yes. look like she's connected, Chair. Um, I think we should just maybe proceed with the, the DG in the interim, Chair. Okay. No, then DG, I think uh, we will actually have to do that. Maybe on the closing comments, we'll actually pick up on the other issues. But can I actually just welcome you, uh, DG, and actually ask yeah. that uh, then be yeah. able to take us through the presentation. Um, uh, good morning. I'm going to sleep after one. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Chair. Uh, uh, Tolo um, will do the presentation. Uh, uh, colleagues, you will recall that uh, uh, the minister gave a very detailed presentation on the 1st of May. And there, I think he highlighted the key chapter. So we'll just briefly recap that. And then we'll, we'll go to the latest developments um, uh, that, that, that has happened over the past uh, six to seven, eight weeks. Um, and as you know, there's been a lot of developments globally and locally. And then we want to just focus on some of the things that we've done, uh, both as a department and then as, as, as a joined up government. And then I'll take you through some of the details. Um, if we recall on the, on the 1st of May, I think the minister set out the clear challenges which I think the, the president also outlined. And that challenge was really obviously, uh, it's the first time it's unprecedented that we've hit in almost 100 years with a, a pandemic of this nature. So we are in uncharted waters. Um, but also government is committed to two things. The one is obviously our first and primary objective is to save lives and to reduce the impact of the uh, COVID-19. The second one is obviously to ensure that li that li what, what the UN calls livelihoods, that we also save livelihoods. That means people must still be able to earn an income, people must be able to live, people must be able to have food and so on. So it's, it's obviously the big challenge is to balance those two imperatives, the need for the health response but also the need to ensure um, that people stay alive and so on. So that was the challenge that, that he framed. And as I said, our clear strategy was um, to do that. As you know, South Africa has been lauded for its response because we went for a early shutdown. And as you know, our early lockdown. And as you know, many people delayed the lockdown. We can see the implications now. So. Uh, we, we can recall that at that point when that presentation was came, we were just mid into the uh, into to the lockdown. But the clear strategy was 
to ensure that that we have a clear um, a, a early, short, sharp uh, lockdown so that we, in a sense, we flatten the curve, we reduce the infection rate, but most importantly, we prepare for the health response that is in terms of putting in place testing, putting in place the tracing, putting in place um, hospital, the obtaining of the PPEs and so on. So the lockdown had a clear strategic objective and that was set out very clearly as our key challenge. Um, I will also then go into a bit into the risk adjusted strategy, but if we go to the next slide. Okay. Now, I think I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this because all of us, I think, have been um, uh, watching the news. There's been a bit of an information overload. But generally, as you can see, um, the WHO just recently made an announcement um, that obviously the, the, the impact is being um, devastating across. I think the United States is now at about 90,000 deaths. Um, the United Kingdom uh, is, is, is in the 30,000s and so on, but also the infection rate and no country has been spared. Uh, and I, I, I won't go into the detail, but you can see that everybody has implemented a lockdown of certain sorts. And then also many countries are now in the phase of where I think the lockdown has served its purpose and they are leading for an easing of it, just as we did going from level five uh, to level four. The good point about is it was it is clear that the the lockdown um, the five week lockdown has been effective. It achieved its core objective. It did reduce the overall rate of infection or it, it flattened the curve. And as you can see there, in terms of the global average, it's 624 persons per million. South Africa is at 290 cases. So we did succeed uh, in flattening the curve and delaying. The, as you know, but uh, it was emphasized that there is no way we are going to be stopping the pandemic. It is going to, things are going to, um, infections are going to increase. Our point was to reduce that rate and then secondly to prepare uh, for that. And, and I think we achieved that broad objective. That slide also gives you just some of the details of the different countries and so on. As I said, we at the lower end at the moment, but as you know, Community transmissions have started, and now we are seeing big increases over the past week um, and so on. If we go to the next slide. Uh, there again, um, uh, the, the, the slide shows um, uh, the timeline uh, for South Africa. As you can see, uh, we had a, the early lockdown. Our first confirmed case was in March the 6th. Um, uh, 2020, and then on March 15th, the, the president announced the national state of disaster. So you can see firm, decisive action, clear leadership has been provided um, uh, by the president and cabinet in introducing on March 26th, the three-week national lockdown, which has then extended. At that point, we had 709 uh, positive um, uh, cases. And as I indicated, if we go further down the slide, you can then see that there has been um, the increase. Uh, we now at about 303,600 uh, 3, positive cases. Um, and uh, that has been uh, uh, laid out um, uh, there. Uh, colleagues, uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, again, this slide again sets out the global infection rate, the South African infection rate, the global deaths. Um, and uh, it's important to emphasize, as I said, whilst we managed to reduce the curve, um, it is expected that we will be um, eating our peak or we would be um, the rate of inf or the number of people infected will be increasing. All the studies show that. And we expect it to peak in, in, in July, August. Um, it is expected. So whilst the numbers are still now comparatively low, it is expected by all, all the studies and all the advice that has been given uh, to government that we, the, 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 we, we, we are heading for our, our peak and we have to prepare for that. But luckily we have use the time effectively to build our resources. And I'll go into a bit more detail on that, how we've prepared um, our PPEs, uh, how we've uh, prepared hospital beds and so on. If we go to the next slide. 
again, uh, this slide uh, gives a, 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 a provincial um, uh, um, a breakdown. Um, and in total now, we, we're sitting as of yesterday at 369 um, uh, deaths. Um, and uh, the the confirmed cases is is is, is nineteen thousand. As you can see, the differential breakdown there. I think everybody is familiar with that. Um, the epicenter of the uh, or, or the furthest of the curve at this uh, point is is the Western Cape, um, where com community transmissions are increasing, especially in um, in the dense urban settlements um, like um, Kayalicha. Um, in the noon uh, and, 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 and the northern suburbs, uh, it is spreading quite uh, rapidly, but it's, it's, it's throughout the Western Cape, even the winelands. And you can see because of the Western Cape's exposure to tourism, uh, uh, the whole um, area has been affected, but also there's been a big increase in the Eastern Cape. And the Eastern Cape is, is also part of a, 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 a big a worry for government. Uh, and as you know, uh, um, the Minister of Health has spent substantial uh, time there. And then KwaZulu-Natal is also has substantial numbers. Then, of course, um, Gauteng as the biggest um, province uh, is also um, a, a, a has, has, has large uh, numbers. If we go to the next slide. I think this this slide again just gives you a bit of the global picture, and it is important to emphasize here that we're really dealing with a global um, uh, pandemic. Uh, we cannot expect uh, to be um, to be different. I think Professor Karim warned us that there's no such thing as South African exceptionalism. That there's something about us that's going to save us from this uh, pandemic. That we're stronger than others. That we um, uh, that I, I, I think the, 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 all this trends, what it shows to us is um, uh, what, what the devastating impact is. As you can see with North America um, at the top, it's basically the United States with, as I indicated, with, with, with currently um, 90,000 um, uh, deaths. And as you know, Europe is also our biggest trading partner, is, our, our, is the epicenter, and this will have impacts later on. But um, the UK, France, Spain, uh, Italy, uh, even Belgium has been really hard hit by it. And then if you look to, to South America, um, the numbers in Brazil is also starting to get into the top five um, in terms of the number of deaths and the number of infections. If we go to the next slide. Um, yeah, again, this gives you a... a, a a, a, a provincial breakdown of the infection trends. As you can see, the black line there is, a, is the Western Cape. And as I said, there's, there's many um, causes for that. Many of it is that um, I think the general um, uh, uh, view is that the Western Cape is at the, at the front of the curve, just like London was in the UK or New York um, in the US. It has been the most exposed um, uh, to, 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 global, um, to the global tourist industry uh, and also because of the dense um, population centers all clustered uh, really close together if you're familiar with the Western Cape and uh, therefore, but um, as I said, it is expected that the other provinces will also be um, having increases. If we go to the next slide. Uh, this gives you more detail in terms of the number of infections per, 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 per million people. And as I said, I won't go into detail on this slide, but again, it shows you there that um, uh, the Western Cape is, 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 is really the, uh, the center with 12,000. And then compared to even a, a dense pro province um, with 15 million people that Gauteng has, um, uh, the, the infection rate is only 2,400, but there you can see even the Eastern Cape is getting close to Gauteng. And again, um, that uh, they shouldn't be that close together given the, um, the different populations uh, and so on. So uh, I think it's, it's uh, as I said, um, special interventions um, are required uh, in the Western Cape and in the Eastern Cape. Next slide. Um, if I then go to the economic actions, as I said, 
the key um, the, the key thrust of the strategy must be first and foremost a health response because if you don't deal and manage the pandemic or reduce the rate it's going to destroy your economy completely it's going to destroy your country so it is not a choice between economics and the health response we have to prioritize the health response to main to save the economy but of course you have to put in place you must reduce the economic impact as far as possible and you must balance these uh, two and therefore uh, as you know very early on in the crisis the dtic um, led the debate within the cluster and we presented and we did a economic impact uh, we did economic impact studies and we presented that to government as a whole and it was that in economic impact studies that led uh, to to the response so the first response was, as I said, was the health response. We needed to procure all the protective equipment, the masks, the ventilators, the um, uh, the testing equipment and so on. So our, our first economic response, and that was that was declared in essential services and the DTI, IDC, NEF, uh, we've prioritized and worked closely with companies to invest in producing the health uh, equipment. So our first response was with the health sector. The second thing was, 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 was to assist the food sector because of course we needed to ensure that there's food um, uh, security. And then we also put into a place, both as DTI and government as a whole, um, clear social protection. We, 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 we ensured that um, consumers are protected, um, uh, that there's no um, uh, uh, price hikes um, price gouging, um, and then we also um, took early action in inducing a risk-adjusted approach. Should we go to the next slide? Uh, now, just uh, turning back briefly to the economic impact, and I did present this um, last week in the, um, in our, uh, uh, our, our APP reports, um, but uh, really there's differing um, estimates. Um, the IMF predicts that GDP will fall by 5.8%, Reserve Bank 6.1%, IDC 6.3%, and then uh, Deloitte 9.1% and so on. As I said, these models are based on different uh, assumptions, but what we can expect is there will be a, a big contraction. And <clears throat> as I said, hopefully it will be somewhere between um, uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the, the range outlined there or even higher, depending on, 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 as I said, we are highly exposed to international trade, depending on how things return uh, in Europe and in North America um, and on the continent, that will affect um, how quickly we get back to growth and, and, and so on. But uh, I think it's important just to have, a, to expect, as I said, a significant knock to the economy and to plan uh, well ahead for that. Next slide. So we put into place um, uh, economic uh, mitigation measures and the president announced that the economic recovery package. And as I said last week, this is unprecedented. Um, 500 billion uh, is 10 percent of GDP. Our GDP is about 5 trillion. Uh, so this is really a significant injection in the economy. And that is aimed, it is because of what we expect to, be, to see a significant contraction in GDP. So this is to mitigate the effect of that contraction. And as I said, I'm not going to go into the detail. Um, the president laid it out very clearly, um, but really part of it is aimed at companies, the 200 billion, these are companies in distress who need um, loans and need access to finance. So uh, providing a, a loan guarantee scheme that will allows the banks then to be able to not be uh, risk averse because they know that they can give the loan to the company government will stand as guarantor for that and that that takes away their risk and that ensures and that, that ensures there is li liquidity in the market um, then we put in place for workers so that was for companies then we put in place a measure for workers and that is 100 billion for the uif and I'll go into detail there, but that has been significant payments has been made to workers who have been on the lockdown um, and who have been um, retrenched or put on, on, on short time. And then there's also the direct payments to individuals. And as you know, um, the, the child grants was increased. 
a, um, a payment was made for unemployed and for informal workers, um, for the informal sector and so on. So I'm not, the rest is laid out there uh, on the slide, but at least we do have a clear um, recovery package which was put in place early to be able to mitigate the economic impact. Next slide. Uh, as I indicated, our biggest uh, one besides providing the, the PPE uh, was food security. So we worked extensively with the food industry and especially the sectors that, um, that we have been working with. So we set out here some of the work we did around the sugar industry, but we helped all the sectors, um, poultry industry, um, uh, we'll come there. We helped um, the big companies, Tiger Brands, Pioneer Foods, um, all of them to be able to ensure that we do have food security during especially the critical period of the lockdown. And we also assisted companies with loans. We also um, uh, unblocked um, different um, uh, pressures that they were under. If we go to the next slide. Uh, as I indicated, we needed to um, to ensure that there's no um, there's no abuse um, taking place, but also that people are able to access loans in this period. So there has been close cooperations with the banks, with the creditors, um, the national credit regulator, um, and the DTI to ensure that people can still access finance even while they're sitting at home. Uh, and as said, we did um, that major um, uh, intervention around ensuring again, uh, as we as we, sh we ensured with a guarantee scheme that's for companies to access finance, um, and uh, this this uh, program was put in place to ensure that consumers can also access credits even during this uh, difficult uh, uh, period, and that is to ensure liquidity for consumers as well. Next slide. Uh, we give here in this uh, some uh, um, uh, some detail on how we've replenished the health stocks. We've worked very closely with the Department of Health and National Treasury with the procurement of these um, goods and services. As you know, we played a, a big role in the establishment of the Solidarity Fund, but also the quick action by the Solidarity Fund to assist in procuring. And their, their big one of their big programs was the, um, the, the procurement of the protective equipment. And then we, as you know, we issued a clear guidelines on how the manufacturing of masks and by way of information for example the schools are going to need about 20 to over 20 million masks and um, about three weeks ago we started working on that with the clothing industry with SACTU um, and with the department of basic education to be able to ensure that um, the production commences um, and that we create local jobs around this opportunity of producing um, the masks um, uh, uh, for the country. We also initiated the National Ventilator Project. That was to ensure that, as you know, um, globally, um, countries were running out of, 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 of ventilators, and we needed to ensure that we have both as the CPAPs, um, the assisted breathing apparatuses um, and ventilators that we are not caught and we, we needed to move early to ensure that we, 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 we develop locally produced products so they're not, not uh, relying completely whilst we are obviously importing as well. Uh, we don't rely completely on the venter, um, on local and that project is proceeding. The prototyping is complete um, and um, we hope to get into production um, uh, shortly. And then, as indicated, we've also done extensive work with the Competition Commission. They've started to prosecute many cases who really exploited the situation, put up the prices of sanitizers, masks, and so on. So we moved early to clamp down on that. We put in place the National Consumer Hotline where people can report immediately, and they have dealt um, very speedily with those uh, cases to ensure that we don't have abuse uh, taking place. Next slide. Uh, as I said here, we just give a bit more detail of the N95 masks that we assisted in producing, the surgical masks, the hand sanitizers, the disinfectant. The, the numbers are indicated there, 2.3 million N95 masks, 30.7 million surgical masks. As I indicated, we expect um, uh, there's there going to be massive infection rates and um, hospitalization 
because as you know, about 10 to 20 percent of people who are, are uh, who test positive require a hospitalization. Um, 80 percent is sometimes is asymptomatic and um, don't require a hospital. They can um, quarantine at home. But that 20 percent and that is that is <coughs> for that you need substantial um, uh, equipment and that and we lay out in detail what we have done and then also as i said we've also assisted the companies to produce a large part of these products um, uh, locally next slide then we've uh, we, we in addition to um, to working with um, uh, with the companies in the food sector and in the pharmaceutical and health um, uh, industry, we obviously have been. Uh, we, we 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 try to keep large parts of the economy um, at least going, and we've assisted um, to break bottlenecks to assist companies to verify the essential status when there's problems with um, uh, police or companies being shut down. We've put in place with Invest South Africa a, a, a full-time network and the economic cluster and the net joints to be able to assist companies. And then, as I said, we really move fast on ensuring that we also uh, prevent the export of our medical products. So we've put in place a mechanism in ITAC where companies before they can export, they need a permit, especially of the medical equipment, because as you know, Everybody is wanting to demand these products, and we must ensure that our local companies, that, that, that we prioritize um, our local population. Um, next slide. Uh, as I said, we, 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 we spent a, a, a large part of the work unlocking and really um, acting on behalf of the companies. We also worked very closely with a number of um, uh, members of parliament who are also assisting um, companies and industries um, and we, we we really thank them for 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 working with us um, and as i as i indicated there we worked with tiger brands uh, pioneer foods with a with the poultry industry to ensure that there is food security and then the other one we really did was uh, to assist to import the um, to bring in the ppe both from uh, from Germany, Frankfurt, we um, we facilitated those flights and emergency landings. We also uh, in China, we worked a lot with some of the big uh, donors like Naspers and others, who were uh, bringing in PPE into the country um, from Jack Ma, uh, who were providing goods. Uh, we we played an active role um, besides for, uh, facilitating local companies um, uh, to operate. But also, we assisted with the um, with with bringing in critical PPE for for the Department of Health. Next slide. Uh, as I indicated, um, the, the the Solidarity Fund has been set up, and government gave its initial capital. Uh, and uh, uh, and and uh, the, the the Solidarity Fund uh, and the Solidarity was of two kinds. The one was to procure PPE. The other one. Was to deliver food parcels um, to to people uh, in distress, um, and uh, and as I said, we also set in place um, for workers in distress. And then, as I said, from the DTI side, we we provided um, both through the IDC. We made a 700 million available from DTI, which we gave to the NEF, the IDC, and CIFA to distribute to companies in distress. Next slide. This slide just indicates the detail. As I indicated, the first measure we put in place as government um, and that we proposed was um, the UIF. And um, as you can see, um, ordinary payouts, 1.8 billion. This is the temporary TERS, is the temporary layoff uh, scheme. Uh, the sh uh, people on short time, 14.1 uh, billion. We've worked extensively, covered entire industries, uh, 40,000, 50,000 workers at a time. Uh, we've been able to working with, with, with the trade unions, bargaining councils and others to ensure that um, workers um, do receive an income during this period. There was extensive dialogue uh, in NEDLAC where we, we worked with all the social partners to ensure that there is a package of support for both companies, for employees, for the unemployed um, and for, for people in distress. Next slide. Uh, we we 
we set out here the work of the NEF. Um, the NEF received over 300 applications in excess of 1 billion. Um, to date, um, 12 projects, about 80 million have been approved. And as I said, in a number of, a big number of companies, we were able to, um, to give repayment holidays um, uh, in this period. That has been a big one. Of course, the only companies that were investing was those companies within the, the PPE doing um, uh, health products and in the food industry. Those were the companies where also we needed to inject um, a new capital. So that is the 12 um, uh, uh, project. The rest was dealt with via the distress funding. Next slide. Uh, we also issued a number of regulations, and as you know, um, uh, there was um, a, a big um, discussions around these ones, um, and I won't go into any detail, um, but as you know, I think people are familiar that uh, because the goods were restricted, uh, and because, um, as I said, even sales of motor vehicles was restricted during the lockdown, we needed to ensure that um, uh, the industry can get back on its feet and under, especially under level four. And that's why we needed to expand the range of products that could be sold. But of course, it couldn't be a complete opening up. And it was in that context that um, a, a, a scaled up version was given for the, the sale of cars, the automotive um, emergency auto repairs, sale of clothing, footwear and bedding at a low level four. And then e-commerce was opened up um, uh, completely once they um, once there was clear undertakings with regards to safety that the deliveries would be safe and that the proper uh, protection will be given to uh, employees and and to consumers uh, and those uh, regulations was issued by the DTIC. Next slide. Uh, as I said, this thing just gives uh, the this slide gives you the details around. Um, these uh, particular regulations, but uh, we had obviously, as you know, um, the automotive sector makes up 7% of GDP. It's a very strategic sector. One third of manufacturing jobs is in the automotive sector. And therefore, we, we had to ensure um, that this sector comes out um, of the, the, the lockdown and especially under level four, and we allowed them to go back to 50% um, uh, production. And we then issued those regulations to ensure, ensure uh, that the, as I said, the only, the, the really positive news we did receive, as I indicated um, uh, from Ford, that despite the global um, uh, pandemic, despite the, the, the decline in global sales, um, Ford is continuing with their 17 billion investment uh, in the expansion of their Ford plant uh, and in the um, the SEZ we're building with the with the 18 suppliers. Um, they gave us about uh, two weeks ago. They indicated to us that they um, they are taking a long term view and they they see South Africa as a critical part of their value chain and that we must proceed fully ahead. So uh, we are working now very actively. We Yesterday, we started the, 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 the bulk works um, for that um, uh, special economic zone and for the 18 companies to be able to locate next to the Ford uh, plant. But on the whole also, we've had um, the Gauteng Premier visited the BMW plant yesterday uh, in the Eastern Cape, um, the Volkswagen, um, really, the management and the company made available a hospital to the Eastern Cape government. Um, but uh, so we were assisting um, that sectors, but we worked with a number of sectors, as I said, um, the construction industry, automotive, uh, the food industry. Uh, we, we, we've interacted with, with all of them and we put in place these recommendations to support these industries. Next slide. Um, as I indicated, this has been the one which has caused a, 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 a bit of um, controversy, but it was really um, the purpose. Um, there was clear interaction with, with the retailers, but they wanted to define the products that was out for sale. Um, and therefore, a, 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 a positive list was drawn up where um, the goods were, were, were specified uh, clearly. But that was, as I said, that was as a result of an interaction uh, between uh, the department, um, the minister, uh, and the industry, uh, where we can, everybody can compete on an equal footing, and everybody 
knows what products are for sale and what is not. And then that, that led to um, the development of a, a dedicated list because we expanded the list of essential items that was required that could be sold during level four. Next slide. Um, uh, similarly, with with e-commerce, as we know, under the the lockdown, uh, e-commerce was also only allowed for essential products. And then many people made the argument, the very good argument, that um, a big part of um, this um, of, of a response to um, the pandemic is actually uh, e-commerce because it is one of the more safer modes. Um, of, of delivery of products rather than people coming out of their houses, um, you get the goods delivered uh, to your door. And also globally, it is the rising um, part of consumer spending, as you know, all over the world, including JCPenney um, in South Africa, it, it goes and so on. The retail stores, the future does also lie in e-commerce and therefore clear regulations was then put in place where we allowed um, e-commerce under level four. Next slide. Um, I've given some detail here again, but as I said, the Competition Commission, the Competition Tribunal, the National Consumer Commission has been very active in ensuring that there's no abuse. And um, the Competition Tribunal confirmed 13 consent orders um, uh, and also, uh, these the, these monies was then made available to the Solidarity Fund, the Competition tri Tribunal, one settlement, um, seven matters awaiting a decision, um, and then, all, as you know, the Competition Commission also has a number of cases for price gouging. Next slide. Uh, yeah, I think you got a presentation on the details on that, so I won't go into this slide where I think the Competition Commission gave you um, a detail and what cases they are dealing with. And I think this slide can also, we can move on. I won't go into the Competition Commission because you've got all the details. Um, and then similarly with the National Consumer Commission, you have the details uh, before you, but as you can see, it's been very, very busy. And as I said, we in the first week of the national disaster, we put in place um, and we, 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 we lined up the institutions to be able to deal um, with this. And the details is there before you and have been given. Next slide. Uh, as I said, there's also been global coordination. The Minister of Health, the President, our Minister has been engaged with their global co counterparts because we must obviously follow best practice. Um, and but also we need tight coordination if we are going to um, deal with this pandemic. Um, firstly, there's the African Union ministers trade meeting was held on the 7th of May. Uh, there was the G20 ministerial, but also very important. We, um, we, we, we have to supply the critical medical stocks to our neighbors. And we facilitated lots of products to Angola, to Zimbabwe, to Mozambique, uh, but also um, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, as you know, it was supposed to come into effect um, 1st of July. There was supposed to be the big African Heads of State Summit to launch. Um, that is now being delayed um, uh, to this, but we still need to ensure that, um, that there is a coherent African response to dealing with a pandemic, but also that we do, um, we build our, our economies um, because you need strong regional coordination um, in this um, pandemic. Next slide. Uh, then I, I think if we start moving towards closure and um, as we wind down the presentation, there's obviously we now in the next phase of this where the lockdown has achieved its major purposes and we need to start scaling down and the president's commitment that we will be moving to level three by the end of um, uh, this month. And uh, uh, as you know, um, we, 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 we obtained the, the key point of the lockdown was to give us time to build our capacity to respond. And that has been um, achieved. And now we are in full preparations now for moving um, to, to level three. Next slide. Again, uh, as you know, we adopted the risk adjustment approach because obviously whilst we need to get the economy back on its feet, we need to move into the next phase. Um, 
we, we, we must ensure that it is done in an orderly way and that we do not move too fast nor too slow. Um, and as to get that balance right, that we adopted the risk adjustment uh, approach. And as you know, the restrictions then ease as we get uh, to, to, to the lower levels. Of course, like in every country uh, in the world, everybody is debating what is the right approach, how fast or how slow to go. But the big warning from the WHO is that you must, you, you must be worried about a second wave um, if you, you, you ease the lockdown too quickly and you move um, uh, too fast. So it is being able to strike that balance that we've developed a risk adjustment approach and the president and minister has been engaged with all sectors to ensure that we have a smooth transition to lower levels. Next slide. Uh, as I indicated, um, uh, the key thing about moving now to level three, where substantial parts of the economy will be opened up, full manufacturing, full construction, um, a number of, uh, we need to ensure now that the workplace is ready, that there's social distancing in place, that there's um, proper screening, there's, there's rapid testing, there's um, sanitizers, um, but that the workplace is ready and there's proper plans put in place uh, uh, in the workplace. And that has been, so the Department of Employment and Labor has issued those guidelines. We have been working actively with industries um, to ensure that they put in place these health measures so that once there is a full return to work, yeah, it's very good. I'm, I'm, I'm very proud to report yesterday, I did a walkabout um, on the DTIC campus and um, our department uh, has put in place all the measures. Um, there's uh, only two access points. When you come in, your, your temperature is taken. There's proper hand sanitizers. Everybody must wear masks uh, and so on. So we wanted to set an example also. So, and we did our deep cleaning um, and, 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 and proper uh, protocols are in place. We set all that in place about two weeks ago. Um, well, and, and we have been ready, um, but I did the, 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 the site inspection uh, yesterday and we're doing that with all of the industry as well to be ready now for when we move to level three. Next slide. <clears throat> as I said, um, uh, President last week spent a lot of time um, and, uh, uh, and this week a lot of time uh, in NEDLAC, he had another round of consultation with business. Um, we've engaged with the sectors both separately and together, with the retailers, with the construction industry. And this is, was all about getting ready for, for level three so that it's a smooth um, transition. And that, but when we do move, we don't get this quick uh, increase in the, also we, as I indicated, we, we we do expect that obviously that the, the peak is only going to be coming in July, June, July, August uh, period. We will be hit with uh, very um, high levels of infections um, and high levels of hospitalization. We must still ensure that we don't lose the gains of the lockdown by moving uh, too fast or companies not ready, getting ready uh, when when employees return, when, when, when full the full workforce. Uh, gets back to work. Next slide. Um, again, I think, Chair, we're heading for closure. I won't be long. I think, um, uh, uh, as I said, the big work now uh, is to ensure that we, we start now also looking at what, um, as you know, the, 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 the economy took a massive hit uh, in terms of GDP, in terms of incomes, uh, in terms of exports, uh, and therefore we are we are starting to to work to to start repairing um, that damage, uh, and we 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 are also realigning our our incentives, our support, working with national treasury so that we can inject liquidity uh, into the economy. You saw yesterday, um, governor of the Reserve Bank reduced interest rates again by by um, by 50 basis points by 0.5 percent. Uh, and uh, this is all part of, of trying to repair the damage um, uh, to the economy and that we ensure. We also must ensure there is a big debate around um, uh, is black empowerment.
necessary in this um, period. Um, and as I said, as I indicated last week, we, uh, we, we, we see no tension between these two imperatives, um, between repairing in the economy and transformation, because we have uh, embedded uh, transformation and be into our programs. And I gave the example of the automotive industry. Um, they are now preparing to return to full uh, production under level three. But as you know, a big part of their program, they will all be level four by, um, by, by next year. They've put in place strong support for black industrialists, for black owned companies to enter the supply chain. Uh, so there's no uh, tension between growing the industry, supporting them during the lockdown, and then also ensuring that there is empowerment and transformation. Next slide. Uh, Chair, um, then in conclusion, as you can see, and as we said at the beginning, the key thing has been that the lock lockdown has achieved its objectives. Uh, it has flattened the curve. It has bought us five, six weeks of time for us to prepare for this. And all the provinces have put in place active measures to be able to deal with the increase uh, in the infection rate. Of course, it has had a devastating impact on the economy. Our job now remains to ensure that we have a proper easing of the lockdown, move to level three, move to level two. Uh, and in that period, all the health and safety measures are in place uh, so that we eat another, but also that we keep livelihoods going. Thank you, Chair. Um, um, thank you, DG. Th thanks for the presentation. Can I actually then um, maybe, because we actually said the Deputy Minister had to do the introductory remarks. One was actually just thinking, uh, I don't know if ever for the Deputy Minister, um, because we actually started with the presentation. Can I check the uh, Secretariat? What? Chair? Both Deputy Ministers joined the meeting, Chair. So yes. I think Deputy Minister Majola, is, if he's able to speak, can address the committee if you choose to let, 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 let you do it now, Chair. Uh, it will be important. Uh, um, can I ask the uh, Deputy Minister, uh, Deputy Minister Majola, um, if uh, ever we can actually then take the opportunity now, then we actually can open up to the committee to interact with the presentation as submitted by the DG. Deputy Minister. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, for the opportunity. And uh, apologies that uh, we couldn't uh, make the opening remarks earlier. Um, and thanks to the Director General for the presentation. I think, uh, Chair, the presentation is well taken. Uh, so we should be now in a position to have a discussion to go through the presentation. The, as the already outlined in the DG's presentation, it is quite clear that uh, the, uh, the big issue facing government, facing the country now, is how do we move the country to level three? And the measures that we need to take to get to, le to level three, the government is in the process of finalizing consultations with regard to how we move to level three. We will now definitely move to level three. There have been a, um, advice received from the side of government uh, with regard to moving to level three, in some cases, uh, conflicting advice with regard to the wisdom of moving rapidly to level three. So that's a matter that uh, is being considered now by government. So we will certainly uh, move to level three. The issue that would now have to be considered is our uh, there are several things that we're looking at, including matters of whether we're going to be applying a differentiated approach uh, to applying uh, alert level three, or should we move the whole of the country to level three? And uh, 
with regard to opening up the economy as shown in the presentation by the DG. I think many parts of the economy have now, are now being moved uh, systematically to ensure that we can uh, get industry back to work and to get our economy to start working again. So the, the matters that uh, are going to require con constant cons uh, consideration would be what happens uh, when the schools open and we, more workers go back to work and uh, there's a spike in infection. So the government is going to have to be ready to ensure that uh, we may have to adjust as we implement our risk adjusted strategy. But overall, uh, Chairperson, I think we're quite happy that uh, consultations have been going well and we should be ready to, to move uh, to level three uh, without a major hindrance and that uh, uh, president uh, will make the necessary um, uh, um, announcements and immediately after that we'll be able to be able to go into details as uh, the different uh, ministries and departments uh, to articulate what should be contained in the uh, revised regulations. Otherwise, uh, uh, Chairperson, thanks, uh, thanks very much uh, uh, for the opportunity and thanks to the DG for the, for the presentation. Okay. We, we will actually then be moving to take um, questions for okay. clarity and or comments. And one will actually then pick up on the uh, list of members that I actually wanted to actually speak through. Can I then say we were requested to make sure that uh, everyone who contributes or speaks should be able to have the video on? Because they say in terms of the other connections, it actually does help a great deal in the communication when the video is on. There might be other technicalities where there might be challenges of connectivity. We'll try and deal with that as we go. Secretariat, do we have uh, those who wanted to comment or questions? Chair, we do have a list. We'll start with Mr. Thring, Chair. Okay. Th Honorable Thring, welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning to colleagues. Uh, and thank you also for the presentation. Uh, Chair, let me just say that the ACDP accepts the uh, apology from the uh, minister with regards to flu. Uh, or his illness, uh, whatever the illness is. Um, I think that when members submit their apologies for being ill, uh, we do not question uh, their, the bona fides. Uh, so from the ACGP side, we accept, and we also wish the minister well uh, and hope that he recovers soon. Uh, having said that, Chair, I think that we are certainly in uncharted waters, and I agree with that. Uh, <clears throat> the the COVID-19, however, the department has compared COVID-19, the minister himself, uh, to the Spanish flu. Um, but the Spanish flu has killed some 50 million people. And just my introductory remarks, Spanish flu has killed some 50 million people, affected 500 million. And the COVID-19 is certainly nowhere near that. Uh, and we certainly hope that it doesn't get to that stage. Uh, however, from the reports that we've been getting in the USA, hospitals appear to be incentivized by giving thousands of dollars uh, to hospitals where a patient is declared COVID uh, infected uh, and, and even more if the patient is placed on ventilators. So one of the possible causes for that huge spike um, in the United States of the number of deaths is also as a result of uh, the incentivization, uh, more so if they're placed on ventilators. Uh, furthermore, I think that in many countries, some of the European countries, it seems as if doctors are encouraged to declare the deceased COVID, uh, even if they are not. Um, I think sadly, some of, the, some of the challenges also that we're finding is the aspect of comorbidities. And, and in, in South Africa, it's something also that I think we need to watch uh, very carefully. Uh, people are, seem to be dying with and not of COVID-19. Um, but having said that, Chair, I think slide 14, um, indicates the substantial unemployment losses estimated in our, from what we've seen from The Economist, estimated to be, be between one, uh, from 1 million to 3 million jobs. Um, and one of the ways to mitigate this is through our beneficiation program. Now, the ACDP has been on record 
as, as saying that we have a tool um, that we are able to use to look at creating employment in South Africa. And the, the beneficiation project is certainly one of those. So my question here, Chair, is can we not just have a list of the beneficiation projects that we have, but also the planned ones? Now, I know that the minister and, and even the, the uh, DG has, has you know, spoken about the fuel cell plants and, and so on, um, but, but that's just, it, it's a drop in the ocean. So, so my call is, is for a, a broad spectrum of beneficiation projects that we could actually look at, put timelines to when those projects are going to kick off and not just speak to the one or twos that we already have um, uh, in, in the making and, and, and on, on, uh, ongoing. And then my, my last question, Chair, is, uh, is what is the detailed plan with respect to removing restrictions uh, placed on e-commerce sales and, and also some of the, uh, in terms of uh, Dr. Professor Gray, who sits on the Ministerial Advisory Committee, some of the ridiculous unscientific restrictions that have been placed on the uh, clothing and the textile sect uh, sector. So what is the detailed plan uh, in terms of removing uh, restrictions? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair? Ms. Yes. Yaku, Chair? Honorable Yaku. Thank you, Chairperson. I hope you can hear um, Basically, I have some comments and some questions to ask. Um, one, um, I, I, the, the, the DG spoke about um, the DTIC having to respond. First, it has to be the health response, and then it has to be the economic response. Um, and with the health response, when I asked the minister the last time, where are the funds of the Solidarity Fund going to? Um, and he said it's not the function of DTIC to see how they met it out. But the DG has alluded to funds of the of 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 um, the Solidarity Fund going to NEF and DT and 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 I think DCI. If I'm not sure. Um, my question is: um, Is the ministry not reacting to to pressure by not thinking clearly where these funds are going to? in terms of the PPE stock, because I know that the PPE material that's been manufactured right now is still not enough to sustain the whole country. Also, in light of the fact that we're going to ease restrictions and going to level three, and there's going to be more infections, I don't think that the, the, the ministry has thought clearly of a plan that's going to sustain the entire South Africa in terms of PPE material to hospitals and to the workers that are going to be going back to work as well. Um, secondly, I'd like to ask, with the emergency loans that have gone through and out to um, to those who've applied for them, um, without going through the due diligence processes that you'd normally go to, how sure are you that those that you've given out, those um, loans, are going to be able to pay them back? Um, okay, third question. I was wondering if the furniture industry um, has been let back in to be able to, to work in terms of your emergency materials, such as your TVs, your fridges, your kettles, etc. cetera. Um, and then um, lastly, I'd like to ask um, also, what was the rationale of letting in some stock be sold and others not be sold? Um, for me, honestly, I feel that DTIC has not, um, really thought through a strategy. I feel like they sit in those meetings where all the ministries sit in and they just assimilate what's given to them without actually thinking of those ones that they're serving, which is your emerging businesses, which is your businesses that are there already, which is your um, your key essential um, service providers. I mean, I, I just could not understand the rationale of not allowing the furniture industry to operate if you're allowing others to operate also um so yeah that's my that's my um input thank you chair thanks sir, chair. honorable miss mantashe yes. honorable mantashe thank you chair Indeed. okay thank you chairperson i i i rise to appreciate the presentation by the DTIC and have a few comments and questions that I want to pose. Firstly, I appreciate the fact that 
Uh, DTIC has not abandoned transformation throughout this crisis. It has not been at the hindsight of it. I can see uh, that they're moving. They have moved on with the master plan for the sugar industry. But I'm worried, Chairperson, whether whether the they 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 are monitoring. Uh, the transformation agenda that we set up in the sugar industry because it has not to be stopped but to be fast tracked so that that industry can be, can be revived. Okay, I also have a question uh, that uh, while, while IDC and NEF have, have, have increased their approvals, won't uh, the department think that fast tracking the measure of the two, or is it not very urgent now to fast track the measure of the two entities so that we can strengthen its muscles to assist more in provision of funding to boost our economy? I appreciate that the auto sector is considered, it has been considered to be open to 50%. But in that on that front, mm-hmm. person, I'm worried about uh, small businesses in the auto sector that do not get consideration from the small business department and are now starting to die out, to, to fall away. And it's going to be a very sad day when they disappear because that sector, seemingly, if we don't assist, will be a sector for whites only. And that will will not accept. Chair, the, the crisis has brought negative things, but I think there is also the positive that we can get out of it. Like what I'm saying, integration or measure of the two entities of the DCIC. And Chair, uh, uh, did you when he was presenting says we import 50 percent of wheat as a country, and I'm worried. What are we going to do with, as a country to deal with the rise in the prices of bread? Looking at the fact that we only have 50% of wheat that we need and we will import the other 50%. Um, uh, I've got a lot of things to I'm just looking through now. Oh, we, we appreciate the fact that a consultation is done with many stakeholders by the government, but we have we have not seen them inviting to the table the, the churches, the leadership of the thing, uh, mm-hmm. uh, churches, churches across the globe. Whether you talk ordinary engagement, where they will talk intervention in giving them relief because they also, some of them are employers and nothing has been said about them. We appreciate that uh, we see the TIC and the ministry look like they are keen to push for the unity of the African countries so that we can increase our economic activities with Africa. I must pause um, mm-hmm. there for now, Chairperson. I will come back later. Thank you. Okay. Well, the other the last thing, Chair, the last thing is that we have received a presentation from NCC and and the Competition Committee. And from those two, I only want to raise one 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 concern that the footprint of the NCC is so minimal in rural provinces. And that creates a crisis because it is consumers of those rural provinces that are victims of unfair treatment by companies. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Honorable Montage, I think uh, your presentation is helping us that. Try and look at the screen as well. You must see yourself. Uh, because okay. Because we're seeing more of your chest now. Um, oh <laughs> no, that's fine. But I'm just saying we have to look at that so that you look at us as well. It will be important. Uh, honorable, uh, 
Thank you, my, my... Montante. <laughs> Thank you. Can, can we actually secretariat? Who's the next one? Um, mute, mute, mute. Okay, Mr. Yeah. May I ask member who is, members who are not speaking to switch off the, the videos in the interim chair? Only members who are speaking should be have the videos, the video cameras on, chair. Okay. That, yeah. Who's, so, Mr. Mulder, chair. Yeah. yeah, Mr. Mulder. Uh, Honorable Mulder. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chair, Honorable Deputy Ministers, members. Um, let me start by saying that we wish the minister well and that he should um, get back to the committee soon. However, the Freedom Front Plus is concerned that the minister has not appeared before the, the committee more often. Uh, it's a very important uh, thing that he should appear before the committee. To give account here, especially where trade and commerce is concerned during this lockdown period. Then it's also common knowledge that the Freedom Front Plus is of opinion, and we've got a different, different opinion of how this whole situation should be handled. We recognize the fact that a balance had to be found between uh, preserving the lives of people and, and the economy. But in an effort to do so, unfortunately, the government has already uh, has destroyed an already empowered economy. Um, and there's too much of micromanagement that took, that took place. And I want to put it on record that this government won't be able to reopen the economy and to handle what is going to come in the, for it in, in the future, especially as far as poverty and hunger is concerned. Um, Chair, we all know that the lockdown has served its purpose. And we, we are of the opinion that the economy should be reopened, not only to, to level three. It should have been done long ago, but with the necessary measures. Uh, we know, all know what the coronavirus is all about, but I'm very, very concerned about the fact that we're not really receiving any new information. With all respect, when I read this, re this presentation last night, I didn't see anything new than was, that was already reported in the news. I think there should be better reporting and that the minister should appear before the committee on an urgent basis more often. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Honorable Mulder. Uh, can Chair, you take Mr. the next? Yes. Mr. Mbuyani. Yes, Honorable Mbuyani. Chairperson, good morning. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, just keep yourself on the screen. Just look at the screen as well. Thank you very much. Your, your picture is the best one I've ever seen since we started engaging. Welcome, um, Wiane. No, thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, let me first welcome the presentation and also wish our minister uh, a very uh, speedy recovery. Uh, Chairperson, my question will be around uh, the conflicting advice in terms of the the, the move uh, to swiftly open the economy, and the other one is the, the risk adjusted strategy. I'm not so sure whether those two are able to talk to each other, and that will be a uh, very specific question. Also, Chairperson, the other one is the, the, the three uh, directives that mm -hmm. have been instructed by our department to say. Uh, let them open the e-commerce, the, 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 the car sales, and also the clothing. I think we have to applaud that move from the department because we know, uh, Chairperson, that uh, most winter clothing and footwear were very much important for our, our society to can be able to access. Chairperson, then my, my, my two clarity thinking question will be, the one will be on localization. Currently, when these issues are, are, are dealing in terms of the COVID, who's dealing with the verification of the localization, why these PPE are being sold in terms of the COVID? Then also, Chairperson, I appreciate that uh, and, and, and acknowledge that the department is still dealing with the, uh, the policy position in terms of the transformation and the upper empowerment of black people in the industry. That is very much uh, important, Chairperson. 
so that we know the economy is one-sided, so that also the black people get a, a, a peace in the economy. Uh, Jefferson, I think also the issue of uh, uh, the, the price gauge and also NCA, this is the NCR. I just wanted to check in terms of the level three framework, the intentions and also the meaning. And also, can we get clarity in terms of because now we're told that this curve will almost be high uh, around June or July in terms of transmission. Then can we be told that the department, what are the strategies in terms of department that are there for them at least to, to, to can be able to do this? Mr. Chairperson, my last comment will be in terms of the, the coexistence. We must be able to understand that this virus here is, is here with us and uh, we are coexisting. With so we must be able at least to have PPE and stick with the regulation of the department. I think from there moving forward, we'll be able to be assisted. I'll pause there for now, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. McPherson, Chair. Honorable McPherson. Thank, thanks very much. Um, I will just say that it is nice to see Mr. Mboyani. He's become somewhat of an internet sensation uh, of late uh, with his, uh, uh, with his uh, screen, uh, not screenshots, but only seeing half of them. So it's nice to see him in full, in full array today. Um, a, a couple of things that I would like to say is that I really um, do not uh, uh, accept the fact that the minister has only appeared before our committee uh, once in this crisis. It's not acceptable. It should not be accepted by anyone in this committee. Um, and, and I really do think that we need an urgent date when the minister will uh, appear before this committee is there some very urgent questions, um, and uh, he himself has committed to do so, um, yet uh, seems uh, un unable to do so. So, DG, I just want to say that on the face of it, the presentation is is a um, is quite frankly just a rehashing of what we've had up to date. I haven't seen anything new in there, uh, and and if I was going to get a presentation from you, I would have rather preferred to see as to what the new APP is going to look like um, and what the department's um, thoughts and, and workings are on, on a new performance plan and, uh, and thoughts and comments around a new budget that's going to have to be tabled. We know that that's coming next month. Um, so if, if you can take us what the uh, key priority focuses are going to be for the department going forward, that would be helpful. I'd also like to um, just get some uh, some clarity. Um, it really seems that you, as the DG of the department, are are, are quite firm in in a belief and an understanding that there is going to be serious uh, economic uh, uh, um, contractions uh, in the in the uh, in the economy. Uh, but we don't know whether the minister actually agrees with that position or is still holding fast to the idea that these numbers by Treasury and IDC are thumbsack, uh, to, to quote him from an interview that he did uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, I, I certainly want to welcome the, uh, uh, the, uh, the U-turn uh, by the Minister and the, co and the Department on e-commerce, but the big question is, is what changed uh, at the outset by saying that it couldn't be allowed because it was unfair to now extolling the virtues of e-commerce. Why did it take 48 days for uh, that epiphany to land uh, in, in the minister and in the, and in the NCC? Um, then on the issue of credit, uh, uh, Deputy Minister and DG, uh, why is it taking so long for the department or the minister to enact Section 11 of the uh, of the National Credit Act, I uh, put a very firm proposal together to the minister more than a month ago, and yet we have absolutely we've had no movement on it, none whatsoever. And and I just want to understand what is taking so long. Why don't we want low-income South Africans to access uh, a credit? 
what is the issue there? And then, of course, I'd like to ask a question uh, of you, DG. If you have any insight as to why micro lenders are not allowed to operate under level four um, and, and what the case has been to not allow them to do so. Because surely micro lenders are a, are a key source of, uh, of access to credit for low income South Africans and whether they are going to be allowed uh, in, in level three. And then finally, I'd like to turn to the, uh, to the deputy minister about an astonishing statement that he's made in his, um, in his comments. He has firmly committed, firmly committed, the president and the government to moving to level three. Those were his direct words, that we are definitely moving to level three. Can I ask where he gets that information from? Uh, I would like to ask uh, where, uh, when this decision has been taken uh, against the definitive uh, fact that he has stated that we are moving to level three. Um, and, and does that not in fact undermine the very consultations that he speaks about uh, if, uh, if there is no room for negotiation or no room for uh, uh, discussions, if that is, in fact, the point. And, and I really think that the Deputy Minister needs to clarify uh, his points because they have quite serious ramifications uh, for us going uh, forward uh, if, if it is being treated as a fait accompli. Thank you. Okay. Can we take the next uh, comment? Uh? Chairperson, Mr. Cuthbert, Chair. Honourable Cuthbert. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chairperson. Chairperson, I'd like to start uh, start out by pointing to the fact that the Minister has not answered written questions that were submitted four months ago. It seems to be an ever-growing trend of failing to put himself before the committee to be held accountable by us. And I've, spoke to, I've spoken to his parliamentary liaison. We've taken it up with the Speaker, but there just seems to be no response. I can't understand how uh, the Minister doesn't believe that Rule 146 of the Standing Order does not apply to him and the fact that he doesn't feel as if he has to account to parliamentarians and the public at large. I think that it's absolutely despicable, Chairperson. Chair, the, the second issue that I would like to raise is regarding the National Lottery Commission's COVID-19 fund and I wanted to know if the DG could please provide us with the list of MPOs and NGOs that have been granted this particular fund. Um, as far as I understand, it's only people who applied in the last two years, and I would like to know if you could please submit a list in writing to us by the time of our next meeting, Chairperson. Uh, Chair, then on to a matter that I raised at our last meeting, which was regarding the EU joint statement that was issued at the WTO. The DG said that he would come with feedback, either in written format or verbally, to explain to us what was happening in Geneva when we decided not to sign this particular joint statement that regarded uh, global supply chains and food security. Um, so if you could please inform us of that, inform us and give us feedback on that particular matter, Chair. And then just if the, if the DG and the Deputy Minister would take us into their confidence to say who the uh, South African Department of Trade and Industry and the Ministry at large are supporting uh, to replace Roberta Azevedo as the Director General of the WTO, and if they could enlighten us on any matters in that regard. Thank you, Chairperson. Okay. Can we take the next step? Yes. Chair, uh, Mrs. Next. Hermans. Mrs. Hermans. Okay. Honorable Hammonds. Thank you, Chairperson, for this opportunity, and thank you, DG, for, um, for the presentation. Uh, we commend the consultation uh, with stakeholders that has taken place at the level of the NCC, sorry, the NCCC, um, in doing the COVID-19 interventions. Um, but I think, given the inputs from members of this committee, I think we must ask the DG, if possible, or the minister at a later stage when he's well enough to uh, speak to us, whether they can unpack the consultation that takes place. Because I think uh, to put a picture out there that the minister is sitting in the interpol sea and just thumb sucking uh, lists and uh, regulation is disingenuous. And I think 
there is a, 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 a broad uh, consultation that with stakeholders that is taking place there. Um, then I just want to uh, mention the issue of e-commerce and opening up products for uh, consumption to the broader South African public. We realize that because of the unequal society that we live in, that that mainly benefits people living in cities and the more uh, well-to-do citizens of the country. And I think that there needs to be a bit more work done in making sure that we open up the range of products that ordinary uh, poor South Africans can have access to. Uh, then can I just ask a, a chairperson, we realize that the minister and um, cabinet are very busy with uh, COVID-19 interventions. But, you know, the, the sugar industry, the transformation in the sugar industry, the road has been long and hard. And I just want to ask the DG to please make a note that, uh, that the regulations will expire for the, for the sugar industry, will expire on, on, at the end of June. So we must just please ask him to to put it on, on his agenda to be dealt with so that we don't lose the gains that we have made. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. Chair, uh, Chair? Mr. Yeah. Jacobs, Chair. Jacobs, Honorable Jacobs. Honorable Jacobs. Uh, can you check the muting part, uh, Secretary? You need to switch on his mic, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Am I audible? Thank you. Go ahead, Chair Cox. Thank you. Good, good morning, uh, uh, Honourable Chair and members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Let me also echo the sentiments of uh, appreciating the, the presentation. I think what the presentation does do, it, it shows a measured response in terms of lives and livelihoods, um, this debate in society has been where uh, there has been a sentiment that we must open up the economy and focus on jobs and livelihoods at the expense of our lives. And I think what we're seeing from the department and the ministry, and certainly from the from the members here, is that we need a, a coexistence of protecting our lives, but at the same time looking at gradual progressive opening up of the economy. So we commend the department and DG and and the ministry led by uh, by the deputy minister here. There's one or two questions that 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 I wanted to ask, uh, which is concerns. Um, in the Cape particular, um, we're picking up that uh, all the protection that's needed for workers is not uh, in place. So there is a perception that uh, the the local fires epidemics will happen on our workplaces, on our factory floors, in the farm areas, uh, in our shops and, 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 and food manufacturing and producing. So uh, it's almost as if workers are going to have to bear the brunt and be exposed uh, uh, more than, than management or bosses. And uh, we just need to ensure that the legislation and also ensure that there's adequate protection. So we welcome the measures, but we just we've noticed that the monitoring and the actual implementation is still very weak and fragmented. We've reported many cases where uh, retail companies are not adhering, uh, they're not doing what is required, so you have local outbreaks. And where the local outbreaks happened, like in like in Witzenberg, in some of the food processing uh, plants, and also in, in some of our retail shops, shop rights and checkers, you don't get the companies coming forward to help, um, and workers are then sent home. So I think it's just a question of ensuring that everybody knows what they need to do and we have a managed process. We're all in this together. And so we want to commend the leadership, um, but also just to ensure that we, we improve in implementation and, and coordination. And we also welcome the approach of the president and the national command in terms of negotiations and consultation, which is more than what is happening here in the Western Cape um, and in Cape Town in particular. Thank you. Okay. The, the next step, uh, uh, Chair, one. Chairperson, there's no further questions, Chairperson.
Okay. Le, let me just actually make a, also a further suggestion. Members have actually made a suggestion or actually have re recommended that we should actually be able to get a feedback. Is that? Okay. Ms. Mantasha? Okay, Mantasha? Okay, I, I just have one question that I want to, 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 to put in. Oh, a, a, just a proposal to the department and the ministry. I just want to ask whether they think it's very fair or is it, will it be okay to move all provinces, all of them at one level, so looking at the rise of infections that I, are appearing in some provinces. And again, Chairperson, on, on the opening of the food sector, we wanted to propose that uh, not only, yes, e-commerce is fine, but we also would love that they consider opening drive foods in those food outlets because the uh, uh, social distancing is effective when you do this. Thank you. Okay. All right. No, thank you. Um, I was actually just hoping that we, we, we can thank Honorable Mantasha for the additional issues that you have raised. But on the part of what I suggest we proceed, it may actually be quite helpful to note issues raised by the members of the committee, because I think what is actually obvious is that the point of concern of being able to get more time to engage with the minister, it's what has come out stronger. We acknowledge, we note that one will actually have to follow through with the, the minister. But I think in terms of the, the comments and questions that have actually come up, we, we, we do actually have uh, the ministry as in the deputy minister and the DG. One was actually hoping to suggest that we ask for comments and questions for clarity to be taken by the DG and the deputy minister and the committee as a portfolio committee to further engage. I will follow through with the minister, check availability so that we can be able to actually make more time to be able to actually engage with the minister. So I think maybe we, we should actually be able to then request uh, DG and the uh, ministry as in deputy ministers that are here to actually speak to questions for clarity and comments and uh, further agree to actually further engage with the minister beyond the meeting we're having today. I hope it makes sense. And if it actually does, then I will actually uh, go back to uh, ministry and DG to be able to comment and actually speak to some of the questions for clarity and some of the issues that were raised by honorable members in terms of this question and comments section. Uh, if we can actually then uh, go back to um, DG first, and then we'll actually ask the uh, ministry or deputy ministers as well to comment. And then maybe we actually have to obviously, as suggested, I think it's a recommendation by members of making sure that we find time soon to further engage with the minister. Can I then uh, proceed in that way um, speak to the deputy ministers and the DG? Maybe take DG <coughs> first. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> as I said, the, the deputy ministers um, will come in. If I could just make some preliminary um, responses. Um, I think if I, I, I go quite um, uh, speedily through it, because a lot of it was comments and um, and suggestions and I think we welcome them from all all, all, all the parties and all the honourable members for for the constructive um, suggestions on how we better manage um, uh, the COVID nineteen response. Um, honourable Tring, I think um, yes again thank you very much and I really must say I'm really I'm glad whenever you speak about um, beneficiation and localization and and the strong position of the ACDP on that because as you know we we 
we really were lonely champions 10, 15 years ago. And I'm really glad we've got a champion in you as well. I'm going to say, as you know, as you indicated, we need a, it's a comprehensive strategy and we need an extended list of, of industries. I would suggest that um, we actually do a full presentation on beneficiation and value addition um, uh, to the portfolio committee because our industrial development um, division has come up with a comprehensive strategy, which, as you say, is not only confined to the fuel cells, hydrogen, um, and fuel selected products. We, we, we're trying to create a creative industry, um, a sort of a, a wider approach where we can use it as one of the key elements of our industrialization drive and our industrial policy. So I definitely will um, will ensure that we share some of our documents with you, but, but ideally we also have a, a intense engagement on beneficiation. Um, I think you've made the point and I will deal with it when other members have also asked about some of the rationale and the question of did we go too far with some of the regulations and, and so on. And then maybe I will deal with it then because I think Honorable Yako has raised it quite, 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 quite crisply and eloquently the question of the health response and the economic response. Um, but firstly, on the question of the Solidarity Fund, I think we must just distinguish these two, um, these two uh, ways in which we, 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 we've been helping companies. So the Solidarity Fund is, a, is, is mainly private sector driven contributions. I think they've got about money of about um, over two billion. May, most of it is private, but I think government put in a contribution of about 200 Two hundred odd million into that solidarity fund, but the bulk of the money is private sector, and they have their own board and their own CEO, which distributes and 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 distributes that money. Uh, they are focused on two big areas for the solidarity fund work. The one is the procurement of PPE, and the second one is to assist vulnerable households with um with income support and um, uh, food parcels and so on. Um, so they, they've they been engaged. They haven't engaged in the question of helping companies, um, small businesses and so on. They've mainly been focused, as I said, on PPE and on um, vulnerable households. Where government has come in National Treasury and DTI in terms of NEF, IDC, um, and then small business department with CIFA, <laughs> And with the, the 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 guarantee fund from National Treasury, those are the funds that has been used to support companies in distress and to support companies making PPE. So I think there is just that that division of labour which I maybe didn't explain um, uh, so clearly. On the question of the procurement, as you know, um, the DTIC's role has been to develop the supply chain capacity to be able to produce these products. So we've made investment and we've assisted companies who've made the, the N95 masks, we've, we've helped companies producing the sanitizers and so on. But the procurement is done by Department of Health and National Treasury and also the provincial health departments. They are the actual procurers of the PPE because they have the budget for it. We are working on the supply side so that we ensure that um, these products are produced locally and in the quantities. And I gave the example of how we managed to get 20 odd million masks in production for Department of Education, but that is our role. Department of Basic Education was the procurer of the mask. They pay for it. We've helped to mobilize the, the union and the industry to be able to produce those things. So that's our um, different role. And I think, Honorable Yako, and um, I, 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 think, uh, I think you made the point there about some of the restrictions and especially on household furniture products and the point about uh, where we led a list. Uh, Chair, I, I know that this is a, uh, I mean, it's a healthy debate and so on, but whether um, the NCC was too restrictive in listing the items. Now, there was a big debate. Do we go for a positive list or a negative list? Now, as you know, a negative list is generally used in the normal, um, when the economy or in a normal regulatory environment, that is you specify what kind of products you don't want to produce. So there was an argument, we should only specify that you should not allow alcohol and cigarettes, the rest should be sold. But then the counter argument was that because we're having a lockdown and because everybody emphasized we must reduce movement of people. They mustn't stay too long in the shops. You mustn't get crowding in the retail shops. You must take people off the roads and so on. That is why the, 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 the debate 
move towards rather having a positive list where you specify only essential items must be good. Because remember, the purpose of the lockdown was to keep people at home and they only leave home for emergencies, for food or medical stuff, and if, if they're essential workers. So therefore, the list of goods available to be sold had to be restricted. And as I said, because of our, um, our high-risk population, as you can see now um, uh, in Western Cape and Eastern Cape, because of our densely populated areas and especially our informal sectors, we are a very vulnerable country to this um, pandemic. And therefore, we had to go, we erred on the side of caution of rather having a restricted list of items. That's why you couldn't buy furniture, you couldn't buy TVs and fridges during this period. That was to limit movement and to limit also, workers have to sell these products in the stores. So it was in that context, and as I know, there is justifiable and legitimate criticism about that. But as I said, it is always a difficult balance to find. We decided to err on the side of caution, and therefore a restricted list was done, both for clothing items, but for household goods, and so on. But as we said, we are now moving away from that period, and so on. And we did achieve its main objective. So it was successful that we did restrict movement and we did have a restricted list of products. As I said, we now have to really be careful as we move into the next um, uh, phase. Honorable Mantashe, again, thanks as always again. As I said, as we have Honorable Tring being a champion of, 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 of beneficiation and localization, I think you are a strong champion and we really welcome all the contributions you've made. Um, rest assured, um, we are, um, as we indicated in our meeting, there is no conflict between between transformation, empowerment, uh, and us having a, a successful economic recovery. You cannot put BE aside, and as Honorable Boyani also put out very clearly, BE is about creating opportunity for black business. We've been denied for almost 100 years to participate and have an opportunity in this economy. So it cannot possibly be that you're going to say during this pandemic, you're going to take away those opportunities for black business. So BE must remain firmly in place because everybody must participate and have the opportunity to produce these goods um, that we need. So, so that's why it's imperative that uh, BE remains, and we want to thank you and the committee um, for, for, for the support. We take your point. We are working very hard on that. We've had a proliferation of institutions, and um, we, we, we agree with you fully that IDC and the NEF um, needs to merge, and we, we, we are working actively on, 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 on that. Uh, your concern about auto and small business point is well taken, and that is precisely why we've set up a very active program. And the real purpose of, of the, e, um, the auto transformation fund, actually, that money is to, so, to support black suppliers throughout the value chain, from dealerships to component suppliers to, 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 um, to garages, to, to repairs, and so on. We, um, we're definitely working with small businesses. We, there's a number of incubators going. There's a number of companies that are coming into the supply chain. So that matter is being addressed. And as I said, we, 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 we could hopefully, the auto industry could also um, update you on those developments with regards to ensuring a black support. Um, Honorable Mantashe, there is some detailed work being done around this big issue you raised around the wheat and the availability for food, and you saw some of the warnings given by SPA and others around food security, food prices, and so on. We're working actively with Department of Agriculture, and even Invest SA Unis uh, has been working actively with um, releasing goods, um, helping companies at the ports. We've been working, as I indicated, with Tiger Brands, Pioneer. We've been unblocking at the ports to be able to get the wheat into the country uh, and, and, and so forth. So we are working on, on, on that front, and as I said, we will keep you updated on that. Similarly, we see... We need to um, work actively on African integration and we, uh, and we need to get the African Continental Free Trade Agreement moving because, as you know, we, 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 the, 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 the continent is very vulnerable because of it, its weak level, um, its low level of industrialization. And therefore, we see um, us um, uh, expediting um, th uh, that work. Honorable Mulder, I think, again, thanks for those um, uh, comments. And again, we, we do agree with you now. Um, 
that uh, it is now time to, to, to open up the economy. As I said, uh, as the president laid out very clearly, we are entering the next phase. Um, he would like to see um, a large part or most of the country moving to, to level um, three. The question was asked, well, what is our view on whether all the provinces should move under Bomantashe? Um, and so, as you said, the risk adjustment strategy just allow for a differentiated approach. It is possible for different areas to be at different uh, levels and so on. But in, in, in every case, of course, you have to balance that with the other consideration is that the economy in South Africa is highly integrated um, and, and, and people move from one area to the other and so on. But as I said, but in principle, it is accepted that there may be necessary to, to, to maybe, not, uh, whether it's now or whether it's in future, but in principle, it is accepted that you need to have the option of um, just uh, um, affecting one uh, part of the country or, or number of parts. As you know, in China, it was only Wuhan that was put under complete lockdown and so on. So um, you, you, you can, but as I said, we, 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 we do remain open uh, to that. Honorable Mboyani has um, asked us just to comment, um, and thanks for your comments, um, Honorable Mboyani, on localization and, um, and on, 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 on empowerment. Uh, the conflicting evidence um, again, uh, with regards to um, do we move to level three, do we, um, do we um, move away from the lockdown, do we open up the economy, and so on. Uh, uh, Chair, as I try to show in the, um, in the overall presentation, this is not just a South African debate. Every country in the world is dealing with this question about how do you balance lives and livelihoods, saving lives and livelihoods. And as I said, and so there's always conflicting advice because as you know, especially um, in the medical profession um, uh, or, or at, at, at a global level, WHO is very concerned about countries moving too fast away, uh, easing the lockdown too fast. And they are saying that you must let the rate of infection must fall before you lock down. So therefore, and as you know, um, many of our uh, medical experts, Professor Karim and others, have been clear that they fully supported the lockdown for the five weeks, but they're saying we should move into the next phase. They are in line with the president's um, uh, thinking. But I think that the, the debate in South Africa is really, we obviously moved, we, because we acted decisively, we had an early lockdown. So it is not that so sometimes we have to balance the thing about, so our infection rate is still on the increase, even though we've flattened the curve, the curve is still moving up, the graph is still moving up. So we obviously are going to have to balance this thing where are we going to get an increase in the number of infections. Hopefully the rate falls, but the, the numbers go up, uh, is going up, but also we, so we don't fully meet that WHO criteria for moving to a lower level. As I said, our rate of infections hasn't fallen. So, in fact, in, in, in many parts of the country, it's increasing. But, so, but that is the debate. But as I said, government needs to get all the information at its disposal. I mean, the NCC meets the year from all the experts. They take into an international WHO, local advice, scientific advice, economic advice, consultation. And that's why, as Honorable Herman says, we've spent a lot of time, and sometimes... Um, uh, we get criticized for spending too much time in consultations, but it is to get these differing views because, of course, business is suffering immensely and they want to move very fast. They want to move to level two and level one um, uh, very quickly. Uh, so uh, it is this conflicting advice, which, as I said, it is the, the, the job of the political leadership to find the right balance between, as I said, between saving lives and, and, and getting livelihoods. Uh, going. Uh, Chair, um, Honorable Mboyani, then um, Honorable McPherson, again, I think you're right. Um, uh, what, 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 what's new and uh, in terms of the new APP, let me get into that issue immediately. Um, uh, as I said, we are working actively now in updating our, our APPs and our strategic plan as we presented to you. Um, we are engaged in that process. We expect that the adjusted budget um, or, or the interactions we've been having with National Treasury 
we've been looking at, um, they've given us a clear, we had a meeting on Monday where they indicated where possibly the budget cuts will be, the extent of the budget cuts, and we expect in the end of June or close to the end of June, the adjusted budget will be um, will be uh, um, finalized uh, and presented to Parliament. Thereafter, there will have to be the revision of the APPs and so on. For us, it's very clear, as you know, because we have been a dynamic organization and we've um, we were early responded to to this. We 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 we're ready for this adjustment. We must make. We see the adjustment is going to take place in a few areas. The first thing, of course, we have to preserve our industries, and we have to ensure that we fully support companies in distress. So our incentive programs, like we've already done with the 700 million, we need to allocate more budget towards keeping companies afloat through the difficult period. So that's our first part. So we, we, we're looking at, and our, we've had some discussions with our DDG Malebo, Mabichi Thompson, in um, in our, our, our industrial financing division. And we're looking at creating a, as I said, a, a broader generic manufacturing incentive, which we can aim at uh, companies and to preserve our industrial base. Then we also need to support those companies who are producing, who are going to grow in the period that is companies producing the PPEs, companies producing food products uh, and, and, and essential goods and so on, and companies who still have export markets. So we also need to keep uh, that program in place for, for expansions uh, and so on. Then we think that there is going to be an opportunity for us to be able to produce these products for the continent as well. And because global supply chains are development, it is an opportunity for us, and we, we want to increase our work on the continent and create our companies to be able to export to the continent. So we need to support that program more clearly. And then the final one, we're looking at amending our APP, is that, as you know, the third phase of the economic, the 500 billion economic recovery of package amount for the president, we want to ensure that we have an infrastructure-led growth um, in the economy. That we we improve our electricity, our water, our um, municipal infrastructure, our industrial parks, and so on. So we are trying to ensure that we use that infrastructure program to also rebuild the industrial sector because we must supply the steel, the cement, the bricks the wood, um, all these products we, we need to supply and we, we're hoping that uh, if we have a proper quick and fast implementation of the infrastructure delivery and we know there is going to be a big infrastructure uh, conference led by Dr. Ramakhopa um, uh, in June, they will be having a conference to, to, to launch our infrastructure program and we are ready then to adapt the supply side of the economy to that. That's some of the thinking, but we are engaged, Honorable McPherson. Uh, we will be giving you a, a, a detailed response on how we will update our strategic plan and our annual uh, performance uh, plan. Your point about e-commerce, I think, as I said, um, the point in take is taken. The only issue I can say is that um, the, the matter was extensively debated, but as I said, especially from the security there was a very strong push that we must have as li they wanted as limited movement on the roads as possible. They didn't, so that is why we restricted the goods in, in, in retail stores, they restricted e-commerce, that was in short so that people only leave, only essential workers are there and so on. As I said, I don't expect we will ever have unanimity on that. Um, uh, around whether the restrictions was too tight uh, or not. But as I said, um, government decided to go in early and a hard lockdown uh, so that we really flattened the curve. And, and as I said, whether we went too far to that, as I said, only time will tell. But as I said, the decision was made um, and, uh, and, and, and uh, well, well, was to err uh, on the side of, of, of caution. On the question of the Credit Act, um, I think the minister will give a, a detailed response on, 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 on that, and I think he has been engaged with the industry on that, um, uh, and, and, and he has also consulted on, the, on Honorable McPherson's proposal. Uh, I can uh, tell Honorable McPherson <coughs> he has given it consideration. He's asked for advice from the department. He's asked for advice um, from uh, the credit regulator and so on. And as I said, he will be giving a considered response 
um, on, 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 on that matter. Um, we will also give you a bit more detail, but I, I know the micro lenders are also under discussion as we speak, uh, and hopefully we will make an announcement on that. Honorable Cuthbert, um, as I said, on the question of the, the funding, I didn't fully understand that question, but we will give you a detailed written response on the funding of, 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 of NGOs. I don't know which one you were specifically uh, uh, funded by, by the lotteries or... Yes, for the COVID fund, the 150 million rand that's being oh, um, allocated. Yes. We can have a list of beneficiaries for that, please. Absolutely. Yes, uh, we'll definitely supply that. And then uh, the detailed response. Oh, on the question of the um, the, the developments within the WTO uh, and so on, I think there is a, we have made a detailed submission to Cabinet and uh, uh, on, on, on developments within WTO. Uh, and on those um, uh, uh, measures that are that are under discussion there, and I think when the um, when our international trade division presents to Parliament, they can give you a full update. Um, and as I said, but we have been act in active um, discussions on that. Similarly, there was also discussions around <coughs> within the Africa Group on the question of the Secretary General of the WTO. <coughs> we are engaged with that, and our ambassador. Um, is, is, is keeping us updated, and we will also give you the latest on, on, on that. Honorable Hermans, um, yes, as I said, we will try to communicate more clearly on the consultations, but as you know, it is a really active process. NEDLAC is constantly uh, meeting uh, to discuss the responses. There's constant engagement with business, with labor, um, with different players, security cluster, with COCTA, um, and we're always trying to find the balance between the different um, why certain regulations. But as you can imagine, because we are restricting economic activity, because um, they, 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 there's a lot of um, uh, um, interest, there's a lot of views and so on. And as I said, it, 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 it's always all we, we were hoping to do is to really to always act in the public interest. Um, on the sugar industry, we will definitely note that. I'll prioritize that and ensure that there's no uh, pushback uh, in our help to that industry and in terms of transformation. And then, Honorable uh, Jacobs, no thanks for your comments and also um, uh, for your support with our balanced approach. Um, yes, I think as you've indicated, um, uh, this, this thing is, is, is a big worry for everyone, even for, for the companies themselves. You know, when people have to get back to work, uh, as you know, there was um, one in the Western Cape where the retail, where there's 50 infections just in one retail store. Um, so, as you know, the essential workers are the most exposed. And as you can see, people working in the health sector, people working in the retail trade are really uh, very vulnerable and we need to have a very clear understanding. So, as we know, um, it must be, and we are adopting an approach where worker safety and um, protection is, is absolutely imperative. We are adopting an approach which, as you know, we are saying there's a no mercy. If, if people do not implement those regulations properly, the company will be closed down. And if they don't put these measures in place and they, they, they aren't ready for it, because the, the social compact we've agreed is that we will have an opening up on, on the economy on condition they put the protective measures in place. But we will be adopting, and as you know, a number of companies has been closed down already where we have found that they haven't implemented the safety um, regulations. Ch and little Chair, um, I'll end on that note. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, we will just, the, the suggestion was that we will actually uh, request the deputy ministers to comment if ever there's actually issues they'd like to talk to. But mm. the suggestion will be to say the committee will have to find time soonest to be able to further engage with the minister. There were issues, issues as well raised of questions that might have been asked. So those are things which I think uh, one should actually agree with the committee. But can I take the Deputy Minister's comments, if any, if not, then can we just then uh, try and conclude in engaging further with the Minister, trying to get time sooner and try and get more time as well.
to further engage with the minister. Can I ask the deputy minister if there are any closing comments? Thanks, thanks, Chairperson. Just maybe before Deputy Minister Gena, um, let me thank you and thank the DG for the responses to those specific questions. And uh, firstly, I would like to thank the honorable members who have uh, conveyed their words of well wishes to the minister. Um, we all hope that the minister will be well soon. So we will convey those sentiments uh, to the minister. Um, uh, and thanks for understanding that he couldn't be here this morning. With regard to the appearance of the minister to the committee, several members have raised this matter. So this is a matter that we will now have to settle. We will work with you, Chairperson, and the minister to ensure that the minister will come to the committee because we want to focus on substantive matters that are, are facing the committee. So as you indicated, we will work with you and in consultation of the minister to make sure that the minister does address the committee as soon as possible. The third issue I would like to raise is with regard to uh, moving to level, five, level three. The president addressed the nation on this matter, and uh, he already said that the country will move to level three, and that uh, there was going to be consultation with stakeholders to determine when and how we move to level three. So that determination was already made and the announcement made by the president. So after consultation, we'll await president to make uh, further announcements. So this is not something that's been said by me. It was said by president already in his address to the nation. The consultations are ongoing and the president will make uh, an announcement in this regard. With regard to the contraction in the economy, there is no doubt, honorable members, that uh, our economy, as will happen with many other economies, will contract quite seriously. So there are different views with regard to, to what extent will the economy contract by different institutions, including uh, international institutions, our own Reserve Bank and the National Treasury, but our economy will contract uh, uh, quite seriously. And in our response uh, to the economic recovery, we have. Uh, okay, so, you so, want me uh, to switch on the video so that. Uh, no, go ahead, the, the GM, uh, go ahead, Deputy Minister. I think this is. Okay. Uh, Someone who just make sure yep. that we mute the others. Go ahead, uh, JP Minister. Okay. We are pleased to have one um, person and assistant JP. So, sorry, um, Honorable Montasha. Montasha. Hello. JP. So, uh, yes. Who's I was talking? saying, so we don't need, we don't need a second chairperson. We don't have a deputy chair. Everyone must listen. To the to the presentation by the DM. So what? Uh, okay, Mantasha, it's fine. DM, can we actually allow you to continue? Okay, try and uh, continue. I'm not too sure the 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 support we're getting from members is just to actually contribute. But the floor is yours, Deputy Minister. If you can proceed. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. I will. I'm, I'm actually just moving to to closure. Uh, um, the next point, Chair, I think there's been a general uh, positive appreciation for the actions that government have taken in response to this uh, very serious crisis. As uh, honorable members have been saying, that these have been uncharted waters for us. And, and the president, when he addressed the nation, he did make this clear that at all times government takes decisions in good faith, that there would be times where government in taking decisions would make mistakes. 
and that where we have made mistakes, we will rectify those mistakes. But we have got to be clear that government is taking decisions in good faith in the interest of all South Africans. Uh, DG, you have responded to the matter of whether we will move all provinces to level three. This is a matter that is being considered. So I did speak about uh, a, a differentiated approach to implementation. So this is something that is being considered. So, but at this point, the only announcement that the president had made was that we'll move the country to level three. So as to whether we will adopt a differentiated approach that uh, will come when the announcement is made after the NCCCC has made a determination. It's quite a complex matter that uh, if uh, you have a differentiated approach, you could within one province increase the movement of people from one district to the next. So those matters will have to be taken into account when a final decision is made. And lastly, Chair, on the list of products, a matter that has been uh, dominant in the in public discourse, I should say this, and the minister will will uh, will repeat this, that there was consultation, as DG was saying, there was consultation with industry with regard to how to approach this matter. And uh, what had happened is that industry did put forward a proposal to the minister on the list. And by and large, the, min the, the list that was published by the minister is the list that uh, uh, came as a proposal from the side of industry. And uh, when the minister speaks to us, he makes this work clear once again. So it is not something that uh, we, the DTIC on its own work through a list we did get uh, um, input, extensive con input from industry with regard to the publication of the list. So, uh, Chair, uh, let me close by saying I'm in agreement, and I'm sure Deputy Minister Gena agrees that we will work with you to ensure that Minister comes to the committee to brief the committee so that we can have a more substantive discussion on the matters that have been raised. And thank you very much for the time. Okay. There might be actually uh, issues relating to program that I thought might be important that we just check with the secretariat. I think sure. uh, the, the, the issues that I actually agreed upon is to be able to actually make a follow-up on the issues raised. Comments that we have actually received will actually be noted. Further engagement with the minister is what is actually consensus and agreement of the committee for us to pursue. But further, I think uh, the secretariat might actually just give some sense on the possible impact or changes relating to program. Secretariat, maybe you can comment on that before we actually uh, conclude our meeting. Chair? Secretariat? Chair, before I conclude, Mr. McPherson wants to, to address the to address the committee or address you, Chair, and then Mr. Cuthbert wanted to raise an issue in relation to the secretary before I speak on the program. I will be guided by you, Chair. <coughs> okay, let's hear the comments, uh, McPherson. McPherson. Honorable Cuthbert. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Chair, I just want to ask the Secretariat through yourself, Chairperson, if we can agree with the DG that we will get a response one week from now, as has been the standard set by the National Credit Regulator, who gave us written responses one week later. Um, also, to, just to remind the Secretariat that we also have responses due for the National Consumer Commission this coming Monday as well, please. Can I just say, uh, while you're there, uh, Honorable Cuthbert, I was just saying that there was some reference to some questions, four months delay. I think yes. those would be the points that would like to actually get sense because mm -hmm. outstanding issues like that. But from what you're saying, I think we actually, let's note that. Which is actually Chief, quite I may. Yeah. If I may. And, yeah, can I take your comment, then come to Secretariat? Secretariat? Thank Cuthbert. you, Chief. 
so chairperson just to differentiate uh the questions that i'm requesting or responses i'm requesting for the nlc are questions i've raised in this meeting and the four month period in that i mentioned earlier is in terms of written questions to ministers through parliament chairperson oh i see okay secretariat Chair, with regard to the questions, I think I, on, on Tuesday I submitted the questions from the N, NCR as well as the IDC regarding the schools. So uh, members would have received it, uh, um, the e email with those questions. Um, Chair, with regarding the program, um, the parliamentary program, the NA committee met yesterday, Chair, so there are some changes that they, that they agreed to, like for instance, Mondays are, are not committee meetings. We can't have committee meetings on Mondays anymore. It's a constituency day. So that impacts on our program. So we'll just have to look around and see how we accommodate the issues that we have. And we will communicate with the members as soon as there is a, 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 a draft program for, the, for, for that will be forwarded to them. So I just want to alert members. There will be slight changes also. And I know next week we originally were supposed to meet on, on, on the Friday, but we're going to next week we're only going to meet on the Tuesday and the Thursday. But it, it captures that the agenda item still remains the same. Also to note, Chair, that the draft budget vote report was distributed to members yesterday, and we did ask members to submit recommendations and, and um, 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 concluding remarks. Also, Mr. Cudbeth, the, 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 there is a response in the report on the WTO as well. If you can just go through the report, it is captured in the report as well, Chair. So those are the things that I thought I'll just need to raise regarding the program in, in itself, yeah. Chair. And we, as soon as we get the, doc, the, 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 uh, the responses, we will distribute it to members, Chair. Okay. Can I actually ask then, McPherson, you, you wanted to make some comments or question. I don't know if ever it's covered or not. Can I actually just ask you to pick up on the point you wanted to raise, McPherson? It doesn't seem like we're still connected. Yes. Okay. Um, can we then actually uh, get to the agenda? In terms of agenda, I'm sure we are at the point where we should actually be rounding up. In the summary that one has given and the administrative side where you're actually indicating about our program. Let's actually then agree, uh, honorable uh, members, yes, and actually the secretariat, that we will actually then uh, conclude our meeting. And thanks uh, everyone for their participation. And um, we will actually then have our next meeting, then uh, uh, secretariat, if we can confirm uh, our next meeting, because we do have uh, in, in the program, you spoke Chair? about Monday. There's no meeting on Monday. There's a Tuesday no, meeting. Yes. Chair, the next meeting is on Tuesday um, at 12 o'clock, Chair. Okay. On Tuesday the platform. 12, that's an ITEC uh, presentation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then we also going to look much. at the first draft of the budget vote report. Okay. Okay. No, thank you very much. Can I then uh, thank all the members of the committee, the deputy ministers, the DG, and everyone who actually was able to come and participate in our space. Thank you very much. Our meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Bye-bye.